you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to be in Exodus chapter number 2. Exodus chapter number 2. I, I love this passage. Um, I, I like it for Mother's Day. Uh, I like it for a lot of other days too. There's just a lot here. And we're not going to dive super deep into this this morning, but we do want to look at it in the, in, in, from the aspect and the point of, uh, of Moses' mother and the decision that she had to make and how God used that in her life and rewarded her. So we're going to look here at the first 10 verses this morning. And Exodus chapter number 2, And there went a man of the house of Levi, and took a wife, a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit what should be done to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river. And her maidens walked along by the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away. And nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter. And he became her son, and she called his name Moses. And she said, Because I drew him out of the water. And I want to speak this morning on the thought, the faith of a mother. And let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together again. Thank you for mom. Lord, I pray that you'd bless our moms today, that you'd be an encouragement to them. Lord, I pray may they feel loved and appreciated by our families, by their church. And Lord, I pray that you'd bless this time together. If there's someone here that's never trusted you as their Savior, I pray that they would find uh, refuge from their sin in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Lord, strengthen us in the way. And Lord, I pray that you'd be honored and glorified by how you speak to our hearts and we respond to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you look at the big context here, really, if you're going to understand what Moses' mother and father were going through, you have to understand the greater context. God had told, <coughs> excuse me, had told Abraham uh, years and years before that this was going to happen, that the Israelites, that their nation was going to find themselves in Egypt, imprisoned, uh, slaves for over 400 years. Uh, it's been 430 and so for the last 430 years, the Israelites have been slaves in Egypt. They came during the famine under Joseph. They were received with open arms and they were treated with honor. But Joseph died and Pharaoh died. And God kept his word to Abraham and blessed the nation of Israel so that the population of Israel continued to, to flourish. And Egypt took notice, and the Pharaoh took notice, a Pharaoh who didn't remember Joseph and what he had done for them and how he had saved life. And he was afraid, and you see all this in chapter 1, uh, but he was afraid that whenever they became attacked, when they came under attack from another nation, that the Israelites would see that they had an opportunity and that they would side with the enemy and that they would overwhelm them. And so he said, let's, let's put them in bondage. And he put them in bondage. And we make much historically about uh, the, the pyramids and all of those things in Egypt. But if you look at it biblically, it was the Hebrew slaves that built those things. It was built on their backs, with their blood, with their sweat, their tears, as they were in bondage to, to Egypt. And God's showing us a picture of what sin does to us. He's showing us a picture of how sin takes us from a place, a promise, where we were, where Abraham was with God, and his descendants, how they were took, taken away into Egypt and then put into bondage. Listen, sin always puts us in bondage. And so we may not feel like we're shackled, but we are. And that sin comes to a place where it controls us and it destroys us. 
and it takes the spiritual life away from us, it takes our desire away from us, and it crushes our spirit. And that's where Israel finds itself. Israel finds itself in a place where it's been now locked away, a dark place, perhaps the lowest point in all of their history. <coughs> it, it, it's a place where they've been enslaved. And not only have they been enslaved for 400 years, but God has largely been silent for 400 years. There have been no prophets. There's no written word. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. And so there's no Genesis. There's nothing other than the word of mouth and what's been passed from generation to generation that's been told to keep alive their faith and their belief in the God of Abraham. They have nothing to turn to. They have no reason to hope. They're crushed under the weight of this burden. There's no spiritual leader. There's no worship. There's no uh, hope that they'll get away from this. There's just a faint, distant promise in the back of their mind from the stories that their mothers told them and their fathers told them at a young age about what God had promised Abraham. Pharaoh becomes increasingly threatened and he gives an order that the firstborn son of every Israelite is to be executed. That when that baby is born, that they are to take that child and simply throw that baby into the river, to drown, to be eaten by crocodiles, to perish. It's cruel. There's no explanation as to why. There's no way to form an appeal. There's nowhere to go for help. There's no reason to hope. There's only broken hearts and mourning. Every pregnancy is a sentence of nine months of misery until you know the gender of that child, until you see whether it's a son or a daughter, after you've prayed for the entire pregnancy for a daughter so that you wouldn't have to throw that child into the river. It's a time when there is a huge dark cloud hovering over them. In the midst of that, God's working they can't sense his working. They can't see it. They don't understand. They don't understand the time frame. But there's a young woman who bears a son. And, he defi and she defies the odds. She hides that child for as long as she can. We've already seen that the Israelites or the, Hebrew, the, the, the Egyptians rather are going through looking. Uh, the, 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 the order is so vile and wicked even to many of the Egyptians that the women were ta that were tasked with being there when the Hebrew children were born and to ensure that they were cast into the river, uh, they basically lied and said to the Pharaoh that they just get birth so fast that by the time we get there, they've already been delivered of the child. And so uh, it, it's, a, it's a vile time even for many of the Egyptians. But this woman hides the child until she can. And then she prepares a basket. Now the Bible doesn't give us a lot of detail about how she prepared the basket other than it's woven and it's pitched. Uh, so there's some water tightness to it. Um, I, I would imagine that she probably put some ballast in the bottom of it to buoy it to keep it from tipping over, rolling over as the baby moved. The Bible doesn't tell us that, but, uh, but she would have done humanly all that she could. She had done humanly all that she could to protect and to preserve the life of her son. <coughs> when she put him in the river with the crocodiles <clears throat> in the basket, she put him in the bulrushes. She put him in a place where she knew that people would come and she hit him there and he began to cry. She left his sister, presumably Miriam, but we don't know that there weren't other sisters, to stand guard, essentially, to see what was going to happen. Did he die? Did he drown? Did the, did the ark sink? Did a crocodile take it? Did someone find him? What happened? Pharaoh's daughter comes to her typical place to bathe, and she hears the baby cry. And as she hears the baby cry, 
she sends someone to investigate. And when they draw him out of the water and they open the basket and they see then that ark, this baby, she recognizes instantly that he's a Hebrew child. And immediately God does something in her heart that bonds her to Moses. And she looks at him and she begins to think, what am I going to do? And then you see really God's providential hand, God's honoring of her faith, God's grace really on display because she took and put into the river her heart, her life, with no knowledge of exactly what would happen, only faith that God would work. And in the midst of that, Pharaoh's daughter gets the baby and then looks and sees a young girl, presumably Moses' sister, watching and says, get me one of the Hebrew women. She gets her mom. And now this slave is being paid by an Egyptian to care for her own child. Now, in our culture, a child is typically nursed for about a year. Sometimes a little less, sometimes a little longer. And even 50 years ago, maybe even less, in Latin American culture, a child would nurse till 10 or 12. Um, in Bible times and culture, it was not uncommon for children to be nursing until they were seven, eight, nine years of age. My point is this, Moses had contact with his mother for a lot longer than just a year. And God graciously intervened. <clears throat> and so I just want to look this morning at some of these things, seeing the big picture. The big picture is Israel's in bondage. It's a picture for us of our sin. And the Savior has been provided in this child. A picture of the coming Messiah that they don't even know anything about yet, essentially, has been given. Oh, there have been promises made since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. The Messiah was promised, uh, but it's a, it's a subtle promise. And so God's working and God's blessing of a woman's faith. And what we see in this passage, first of all, in verse number three is a revelation of that faith. It's easy to sit in church every Sunday when things that, for the most part, in our lives go fairly well. Oh, you sure we have tough times and we have to deal with disease and sickness and different things that come around and weather events, but we pull our resources and support one another and, and, and help and, uh, and care for one another and try to help meet needs as best we can. And until that is put to the test, you really don't know what you have. And there's a young woman <coughs> who up to this point, we don't know anything about. We don't know how deep her faith is. It's hard to imagine that her faith would have been incredibly strong given the fact that for 400 years she hasn't learned anything formally about God or what his expectations are, or what his character and nature is. It's only what's been passed down. So there's no evidence that she was already a woman of great faith, but she had enough faith to put a baby in a river. She had enough faith to prepare an ark. She had enough faith to take things out of her own hands and to put them into God's hands. She had things in her own hands up until this point. And when it got to the point where her own hands were no longer enough, she put the child in the hands of God. And God honored and blessed her for that. And what we see is that here's this woman who there comes a time that her faith has to emerge in this hour of need. And the revelation of our faith only emerges when it's tested. It's easy to sit in a service and say amen. It's easy to read the Bible and be encouraged. It's easy to sing songs that lift our spirits. But what do we do and where is our faith when the trials come, when betrayal comes, when hurt comes, when attacks come, when serious disease comes, when you stand alone, Whenever there's no one else there with you to help. What, what, where is your faith then? That's what we find out. See, I can learn a lot and I can develop skills and I can make plans and I can 
reason when this happens, this is what I'll do. But until you're actually put in the line of fire, you don't really know what you'll do. It's all theory until it's not. And for Jochebed, it's no longer theory. For her, it's real. And the danger is real. And the sacrifice is real. And the heartache is real. There's no way that she didn't put that child in that river without many tears. That she did not lay awake for the days and the weeks ahead, anguishing in her soul about what she was going to have to do with no guarantee that it would preserve his life or that it would save him. And she also had no idea that in 80 years time that this man would come back and lead those people of Israel out of Egypt across the Red Sea to a walk with God. She didn't know who he was. She was just her little baby. He was just her son. He was just that one that she tried to protect because that's what mothers do. She had no idea how God's hand would be on him. I think one of the great travesties of our day is the lack of men that love the Lord and lead their homes and preach the gospel. And I fear that many of those men were taken from their mother's womb before they ever had a chance at life. Praise God for a woman who defied the odds, who stood up and said, this is what God has given and I'm going to stand there. I applaud uh, our single moms that have the courage to go it alone and to, uh, to make right the things in their life that need to be made right and pledge themselves to, to live the, the, for the Lord, to love their children, to teach them to love God. And they need all the support and the love and the encouragement that their church family can give them. That we Listen, we don't know God, other than those little kids that get on the vans and come to church. And, uh, and in many cases, uh, they're just being sent. So moms and dads or mom or dad has a babysitter for the day. But they come and they hear the gospel and they that have people pour into them and try to cultivate in them a love for Christ. And what a wonderful thing it is when one of them really gets and grabs hold of that principle and goes and lives for God and answer God's call in their life, whatever that might be, uh, and serves them for their whole life. God does great things in the midst of great tragedy. My friends, this story really is tragic as much as it is a time of rejoicing. The outcome is miraculous, but it was made possible because of mom's faith. And we see her faith emerge when she prepared the ark. And I would say this morning, this revelation of faith was revealed as she prepared that ark. <clears throat> now, I think this is one of those type of deals where if you lived in that time, you really had a visual picture without it being explained as to what that would look like. But really, it's nothing more than a basket pitched with pitch, tar, something to seal the water out of it. Wouldn't have been very attractive. Would have been made, in her case, rather hastily. And... <clears throat> But the preparation of it showed her faith. Hey, I, I need God. I can't do this. I can't save my child. The only one that can is the Lord. But I'm not going to just sit here and hold them until they come and rip him from my arms and spear him or throw him in the river. I'm going to do what I can do. And she prepares the ark. We see her faith emerge and it's revealed when she sends his sister to follow him. What does that say? Well, to me, what it signifies is, is that she had an expectation that God was going to do something. Maybe she just sent him to find out what would happen. But I believe that she expected for God to do something. She had done what she could and she put her hands in the hands of God and her child in the hands of God and her faith emerged. And, and the reality is, is that those times in our life draw out what our faith really is. I mean, there's a question this morning. Does your greatest fear defeat you or does it draw out your faith? 
When the greatest challenge that you face in life comes upon you, when the worst news possible comes upon you, does it cause you to hunker down in fear and to shut down or does it draw out your faith and help you emerge in your relationship and your walk and your confidence and your dependence upon God? Her faith in trial is the revelation of faith. Then secondly, we see that that faith is rewarded. The faith is rewarded. It is a reward of faith. In verse number five, and the daughter of Pharaoh came to wash herself at the river and her maidens walked along by the river side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent on her maid to fetch it. Listen, immediately God is protected. Immediately God has preserved life. Her faith is rewarded. Why? Because Moses is found by Pharaoh's daughter. He found compassion from someone who should have wanted to destroy him. He found compassion in someone whose allegiance should have been to her Pharaoh. But instead, her heart was broken and captivated by this child. Every good thing about, that's about to happen to him is a reward of God for her mother, his mother's face, faith. God looked down with a plan for Moses, formed by God in her womb, chosen to lead out this children of Israel from Egypt in bondage, chosen to lead them. And his whole life would be a preparation. And this whole evolution of things has taken place is setting the stage for the, for the teaching and the training and the development of Moses as a leader. He grew up in royalty, went to the best schools, had the best training, was part of the greatest military, was a leader there, won battles until he finally made a decision that he was going to stand with his people instead of enjoying the privilege that had been provided him. And when those people turned on him, he had to flee. And he spent 40 years in comfort and royalty in Egypt before he would spend the next 40 years of his life on the backside of a desert. God taught him I had to talk to me this way years ago. In the first 40 years of Moses' life, God taught him how to be somebody. In the second 40 years of Moses' life, he taught him how to be nobody. On the backside of a desert, tending his father-in-law's sheep. And in the last 40 years of his life, he lived 120 years. God taught him what he, God could do with someone who knew he was a nobody, but that God had made a somebody. And Moses exemplifies the hand and the power of God throughout his lifetime as God is working. But no one in this stage can see that. They're still in slavery. They're still being beaten. They're still making bricks. They're still uh, undergoing uh, the rigors of, uh, of brutal treatment. But Moses, placed in a basket, found by Pharaoh's daughter, is, finds compassion, finds love as the, the faith of his mother is honored. Secondly, Moses then is given back to his mother for him to care for her. What a gift from God to take and place that child back in your hand. A slave is paid to care for her own child. God's blessings came as a reward for her faith, I believe. Listen, you can't go wrong by expressing faith in the Lord. There's a revelation of faith. There's a reward of faith. And then lastly, I see that we bring, that brings about the result of faith. Now, we don't see that in our text passage this morning. We see that throughout Moses' life. And I'm just going to draw out some of the obvious things here. What we see, first of all, is that 80 years from this time, as I just demonstrated, Israel will be emancipated. Moses will go back. And the way that God delivers them is, is miraculous. God is not going to leave Egypt unjudged for what he's done to the children of Israel. And when Pharaoh hardens his heart, <clears throat> and a lot of times people have a hard time understanding, why would God harden Pharaoh's heart? If you understand the passage, it's not making the case that God turned Pharaoh's heart hard. Listen, the same sun and the heat from the sun that melts chocolate hardens concrete. What he's revealing is that when God showed himself 
in Moses' life to Pharaoh that the response of Pharaoh's heart to God hardened his heart. Did God harden his heart? Yeah, in the same way that the sun hardens concrete. But God did not force Pharaoh's heart to be hard. God simply tells us the response of Pharaoh to God's working in their midst. He refused to obey the Lord. Ten plagues would come. Their crops were devastated. Their livestock was devastated. Their water supply was devastated. Their comfort was devastated. They had been shamed. And ultimately, whenever they crossed the Red Sea and Pharaoh sent his army after him, the greatest military force on the face of the earth of the day was drowned in the Red Sea by God. He even destroyed their military. He left them a shambles because of what they had done for 400 years to his people. And God led them out by a little boy who was now a man who was pulled out of the river by Pharaoh's own daughter because a mother had the faith to put him in. He was emancipating the people of God as a result of his mother's faith. We receive the word of God, the first five books of it, because of this woman's faith. So, Pastor, God could have given us his word in any number of ways. Yeah, he could have. But he chose to give us the first five books through Moses. He chose for the Holy Spirit to inspire Moses. He, cho he chose Moses to write it all down. All the way from in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth to his death. Moses records for us the works of God and how he moved and all of the things of those early years on the earth. The receiving of God's word is due to the faith of a mother who was in slavery at the edge of the Nile in Egypt, who unless God had told us about her, we would know nothing. We would not know her name. We would not know anything about her. And what we see is that because of that, we've seen throughout history the delivery of God's promises. Moses wrote about the fall of man in the garden. And immediately he said, when they fell, and he's correcting things, he says that the seed of the woman would bruise the heel, or the head, the heel of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent. That is the first promise of the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ in the scripture. When you look and you see how God has worked, God is delivering his promises and he's delivered on his promises and he'll continue to deliver on his promises. Say, Pastor, do you believe that God works in our hearts and lives today? Absolutely. Why? Because he told us he does. Because I've experienced it in my own life. Because I know that many of you have experienced it in your lives. God is working and God keeps his word. He may not always keep it by my timetable or according to my preference or to my understanding, but it's always perfect. It's always on time and it's always with the big picture in view. So oftentimes we want to just do things and see things according to the small little window of sight that we have in the few years of our life and in, in the contrast of eternity. God sees it all. He knows every part. He knows every wrinkle. He knows everything that's small and minute that seems to be unimportant. Do you realize and remember that was it 1982 or 3 when the space shuttle Challenger blew up that it blew up because an O-ring failed? An O-ring that's in every one of our cars? An O-ring that's in virtually everything mechanical? It seals gaps. It's not much to it. It's just a little circle of rubber. You put some grease on it, slide it into the groove that's machined into the material that it's there and it does its job. And if it fails, it's catastrophic. So pastor, all I am in the light of eternity is just a little O-ring and that's how important you are, is that little O-ring. So you don't have to have your name on the marquee or out on a sign or be well known to be important to the Lord. You just have to have faith in him and walk with him and let him love you. Pastor, what if God never does anything great with my life? You, you aren't the judge of that. God is. 
and you may not live to see what God does great with your life because it may not manifest itself until a future generation, but it's what you invested in it and how you led and how you loved and how you taught that made the difference in someone's life that caused God to work. There is the delivery of the promises of God. Moms are probably in our early years, without a doubt, the single most important person in our lives. I'm not discounting dads. Even, I even read a news article, I think, yesterday, where even some politicians are starting to wake up to the fact that a large part of the reason why our country is in such pro trouble is because of the, of the lack of fathers in the home. The very people that the world wants to vilify is what the home is missing that would set things in order. One of the greatest challenges that I have as a pastor in helping your children learn to love the Lord and what Brother Trevon has as a youth pastor is fathers that don't love the Lord, that don't lead their family spiritually, that just leave all of that to mom's care. Moms, you do a great job. I applaud you. Dad, stand up and be real men and lead your family. So Pastor's Mother's Day, not Father's Day. I'm going to be preaching at New Life on Father's Day, so I've got to get my shots in while I can. <laughs> and so I'm just saying this morning, realize, moms, that you form our personalities, that you form our early values, that you instill in us the idea of what it is to love and to be loved, that you impart to us by touch and by empathy, things that dads are incapable of giving. There are things that I give my children that I really tried to give them like mom gave them whenever they were little, but I really couldn't give them to them until they were 10, 12, 13, 14. All of that early nurturing, I was there, I was a part of it. I fed them from the bottle. I changed their diapers. I got up with them in the night unless I was working two jobs. And then that time she was good about letting me sleep. But I'm just saying, moms, we owe you virtually everything. Do you realize that dad doesn't have much to work with if mom doesn't do her job when they're in the, cri in the crib? And those of you that love the Lord and walk with God or you're trying to figure that out and you're learning, I commend you. Don't give up. Don't get discouraged. Just say, Pastor, you don't know what a mess I've made out of my life. I know this. I know that he does and he said that there's not anything that's too big of a mess for him to clean up and fix. Say, Pastor, I'm all alone. No, you're not. The Lord's with you. Amen. Pastor, I don't have support. You have the support of a church family that loves you. Pastor, what if I mess up again? Then we'll help you pick up the pieces as long as your heart's in tune to getting right with God and walking with him and serving him. And we'll be there every step of the way. Pastor, it's going to be a long journey. I know it's going to be hard, but you can do it with God's help and God's strength. And your child can grow up to honor and glorify the Lord and take what to you feel like at this point in your life may be a shame and turn it into something that's a powerful blessing and testimony that God can use to encourage others to keep living for God and serving him. Listen, God can take every bad thing in our life and make it beautiful. Yes, out. There's a river out there. And there's, there's a, an enemy that wants to destroy your child this morning. And those of you who got small children at home especially, there's an enemy out there that has created a world system that is designed to destroy your family, to destroy your child, to destroy biblical values, to destroy the idea and the image of God in their heart and their mind and to make that which is good evil. And there's a river and God's waiting for you to put that little child in that basket and put him in the river. So pastor, what river? Well, when it's coming down, there'll be one right out front here on the service. But the river of your faith in God. The river of saying, God, I can't do this, but you can. And I'm going to put my child in your hands. And with your help, I'm going to lead them and I'm going to love them to love you and to serve you and to follow you all the days of their life. 
What is that? I'm just telling you this morning that the faith of a mother is a huge, huge deal. So, Pastor, I'm a mom and I didn't find Christ until I was later in life. Serve God with all your heart, even if your children are grown, and stand back and be amazed at what God can do with your faith in time. May not happen overnight, and that may get discouraging at times, but just put it in the hands of God and let God be honored and glorified. He'll keep his promise. He's duty bound to do so. He loves you. He cares for you, and he wants to do great things with your life and with the lives of your children. And we thank you for the investment that you've made in ours.